Hello, friends, and welcome to the Wisdom for Life broadcast. This is Pastor Glenn with another episode that we hope will bless you. And if you would turn in your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 1, verse 52. The reason why the lights are off this, uh, this morning is we're going to have a little bit of a candlelight sing-song service at the end. How many of you remember that? How, who's old enough to remember, I'd like to teach the world to sing? One of those, okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, Luke chapter 52, or chapter 1, verse 52. How about that? There isn't a Luke 52, man. Might need to turn the lights on after all. <laughs> all right, so when we get to this point in the Christmas story, it's early on. This is what's called the Magnificent. This is Mary's song. There are two themes that are within it that I want to bring some balance to this morning. Because how many of you know that Christmas is certainly a time to celebrate? Yes. But it's also a time to consecrate. And usually what we get wrapped up in is the celebration and we forget the consecration. And Mary gives this prophetic song before her son Jesus Christ is born and it carries both of those themes. If you could think of this prophetic moment as two mountain peaks and you're seeing both of them as you look from afar of what Jesus will do. One part of the theme has to do with him coming as a baby and bringing joy and bringing salvation to the world. The other theme has to do with him coming as a king and as a warrior who will turn the world upside down. How many of you know that Jesus represents both? In the first coming, we call it Advent. Let's use that word together, please. Advent. That was the first Advent. It comes from the Latin Adventus. It means coming. But we know that there is a second coming as well, or a second Advent, where Jesus will not come as a baby. He'll come as a king. And he'll be on a white horse. And that's the passage of the text we're going to read this morning. And it gives us balance to understand and appropriate Christmas in the right fashion to our faith this morning. Luke 1.52, he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry, praise God, with good things, but he has sent the rich away. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants, not just in the past, but forever. Even as he has said to our fathers, would you pray with me? Father, in the name of Jesus, help us to see both in your son. He is someone to celebrate. He is also someone to consecrate for. The balance of the story of Christmas is to prepare our lives to be given back to him. He gave it all. So we fully consecrate and give all back to Him. In light of His coming, Lord, we want to be prepared. Many were not ready, God, when He came the first time. Many more will not be ready when He comes again. May everyone in this room be ready. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, when you first read this, if you were Santa Claus and read this passage, you'd probably do one of those Fred Sanford moments. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Elizabeth! I mean, Santa Claus would probably not like this story. Jesus coming to turn the world, flip it upside down like a pancake. Whoever is ruling will now be brought down. Who, whoever is rich will be sent away. But the hungry and the humble will be filled and lifted up. This is... An act of Jesus Christ, just as much as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. You know, if we talk about mangers this morning, I think there's a little bit of manger danger in the way we approach Christian, uh, Christianity and the way we approach Christmas with Western eyes. In a Western culture, we believe that we prepare ourselves with Christmas by not eating until Christmas dinner. Are you with me? That's the only preparation that ever happens sometimes in our... 
I'm all alone. Great. I'm used to that in this church. I prepare myself, I consecrate myself for the dinner that is to come. And then when the, and then when the, the Miss Penny's back there shaking her head. She's like, stick to the notes, Glenn. You, but because I know that I'm about to receive, and I'm going to receive in such abundance that there needs to be room. And then I'm going to fall asleep and make loud noises from the couch. Then I'm going to wake myself up from those loud noises, walk back into the kitchen, and repeat. Rinse and repeat. That is the substance of what we do to prepare. That is the end of our consecration. (laughs) If we think about Lent, not just Advent, but if we think about Lent, there are those that have the faith tradition that they prepare themselves for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It all begins with Ash Wednesday. We don't put little dots on our heads, but before you dismiss that, just understand there's beauty in that. Just understand that that is someone who has decided to prepare their heart, and many times they make room, they fast, up until celebration of resurrection so that they would gain a better understanding. Celebration, consecration, they come together. That is the story of his birth. That is the story of his death, resurrection. That is the story of the glory. If we think about Christmas, we should have the same spirit of Advent that is preparing our hearts each Sunday for that moment of receiving his coming. Now, unfortunately, we don't teach our kids this sometimes. How many of you know what this is? This is an Advent calendar. How many of you know what an Advent calendar is? Okay, three or four people. You're going to figure out real quick. We're going to have a little fun this morning. Can we have fun? Yes. No, can we have fun? Yes. I'm asking the back row, can we have fun? All right, so what we're going to do is, I have three Advent calendars, and how many of you know what you do with these? You bust into these like Gustus Gloop. Charlie and the Chocolate, you know the fat German kid? Charlie and the Chocolate, oh, now you're there. I want to see you in your row. This is A section, this is B section, and your C section. (laughs) Okay? So what we're going to do, can we have a little, some of you are all there, like, checked out. I'm leaving. Hi, C section. (laughs) That just occurred to me. We should have called it something else. One, two, three. Okay, so what we're going to do is you're going to bust through these, and you're going to pass them back as fast as you can. You're going to get your little chocolate out. And you're going to eat it as fast as you can. you do that? Yeah. All right, one person. Listen, you don't have to. I'll take these home and eat them all myself. I don't care. I really don't care. Are you ready? Give me some music, brother. Yeah, right now. Give me a countdown. Three, two, one. Here you go, C-section. Go, 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 go. Merry Christmas, everyone. Hurry it up. Give me just a minute, brother. Just a minute. Tell me when a minute's up. Oh, you can't tear it out like that. You got to go one by one. (laughs) Hallelujah. Wait a minute, man. B section is rocking it here. (laughs) Who's going to win? Come on, A section. You can do it. Come on, come on, you can do it. You gotta cheer your people on. You gotta cheer those people on. Used to be candy right here. Where'd it go? Hey, where'd the candy go? Where'd that box of candy go from back there? Here it comes. A section, awesome. Come on, B section. Cheer yourselves on. Hurry. Here you go. <laughs> how, far, how far are you, B-section? Go, go, go. C-section, where are you at? Come on. 
Have that baby already. <laughs> Hurry it up. Are you done? Are you done? Give yourselves a hand. Come on. Woo! <laughs> All right, that's good. Wow. A section is the winner. Come on, give them a hand. It's awesome. So I just want you to take a look at how they, this was their strategy though. Is that cheating? Wait a minute, the bottom row isn't open. Yeah, it is. They just tore it. Look. I didn't tell, I tell, I didn't tell them anything. Oh, okay. Only, okay. Did, did you eat all your candy though? That's the important thing. Awesome. Hey, listen, c section is still going at, so is B. Give yourselves a hand real quick. Thank you. So I don't, know, I don't know what you taught your kids about Christmas, but this is all supposed to be about preparing them for Christmas. And uh, at my house, the, there was no consecration. As you can see, at my house, what would happen is every year my wife would buy, would buy three of these Advent calendars, right? And, and, and as parents, we would go out and say, kids, you could take one for each day. And then you have to wait 24 hours until you can get another piece. How, what kind of religious torture is that? Is that something? Well, here's what would happen. My son, who is a pastor right now, uh, and, and I don't know how he got into the ministry because he grew up kind of evil, but anyway, he would grab his sister's advent calendars and his, take them into his room, and it, they'd end up looking like this in one day. And then he'd come out and he had chocolate all over his face and fingers and stuff, and he, he'd say, I don't know how it got that way, Dad. I don't know what happened to the, to the chocolate. How, oh, the chocolate monster got it. Hey, this morning, I want to ask you something. Can you wait? Can, can you wait? Because that's, uh, that's 90% of Christianity. Your faith is about waiting. It's about waiting for Christ and preparing your heart, consecrating your life for the good things that God is bringing to you. And in the meantime, you're making room so that there is placement for what God wants to give you and until then you wait we don't get into this idea of instant or immediate gratification as believers we wait upon the Lord right we wait for marriage okay two three people my wife being one of them praise God that's great we don't we wait on spending things we don't get ourselves in a lot of debt. We don't live like the world. We wait upon the Lord. We let the Lord come. We invite Him into our life in all of the goodness that He has, and we trust Him to meet our needs. Even we wait upon the Lord for what needs to change in this world. Because how many of you know only Jesus can change it? Easter comes, we eat, sleep, eat some more. Christmas comes, we eat, sleep, eat some more. That's celebration. That's good. Say good. good. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that, but consecration and waiting on the Lord is important too. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9, 28. It says, To those who eagerly wait, Wait, hallelujah, for him. He will appear a second time, and apart from sin, for salvation. The true Christmas spirit isn't fighting over the flat screen televisions at Walmart on Black Friday. We wait upon the Lord, right? The true Christmas spirit is because a child was born, and we celebrate that. But also, we consecrate in our waiting for the soon coming king. How many of you have ever been asked at Christmas, did you get everything you want? And how many of you know that's opposite of what I'm preaching this morning? Think about it. It's Jesus' birthday, and yet he's the one giving. I praise God that I had very well-meaning parents, but in growing up, I didn't always get what I wanted. How many of you know that that's okay? In fact, that's a big part of raising up 
Christians, believers at any age, you're not always going to get what you want. In fact, there was a song that came out in the 60s that says, you can't always get what you want. But you get what you need. You knew the rest of that song. Baby, I'm glad I married you. You're all right. So what we wait upon is what we need. And God always shows up. He showed up the first time. He'll show up the second time. Faithfully. And in the great exchange of waiting... We make room and empty ourselves to be full of the joy that is to come. You know, Martin Luther called this the great exchange. I give of my life to him, but in return, I get eternal life. I give of some of the income I have to him, and in return, I can enjoy every need met. I I give of my service to him. And in return, I get to enjoy an eternal heaven with others where we can all serve Him together. How many of you know that's not a bad deal? (laughs) I think that's pretty good. But can I tell you one more thing? We're going to land this plane in a little bit on this one word. There is fullness of joy in consecration. When you're willing to give yourself fully to the Lord, the return is fullness of joy. Of joy. How many of you know that joy doesn't work unless you're full? Joy is not a joy is not a half full thing. It's a full thing. Let me put it to you this way: My dog Chloe, if I fill her bowl in the morning with half the amount of what she wants for breakfast, how many of you know that that's not good for Chloe? She she wants a full bowl. Obviously, you haven't met Chloe. One of these days, I'll bring her in here, okay, for a full, like, three seconds, and then she'll be out. She wants a full bowl. Hey, when you got here to church this morning, how many of you know that fullness is how your tires keep your car up? I'm going to stay on your car for a minute. How many of you know that you shouldn't drive around with an empty gas tank? Because that might do something to your fuel pump. You... Joe, you can come up and preach the rest of the message if you want. It's awesome, buddy. I love you, Joe. Joe's my buddy. <laughs> it, and there's always something from the peanut gallery in this church. There, there, you know, this ain't even funny. I, I walked in this morning, and I, I told somebody, I said, I got some good advice for you. And you know what I was going to say? Have a good time all the time. I never got that out. You know what they said? I got some advice for you, Pastor. I said, oh, yeah? What's that? Don't eat yellow snow. That shut me up, man. I'm like, well, we better, we better just leave on that one. Yeah. All right, talking about fullness of joy. We, <laughs> we give ourselves in consecration to Him. We make room. And in return, He brings us fullness of joy. I want you to think about this for a second. Jesus said this. He said, in my words that I speak to you, you'll have fullness of joy. They they literally come from the words of Christ. In in receiving the word of Jesus Christ into your life, you can have fullness of joy. Let let me tell you how that works. Because it doesn't look like you think it does. You can be as empty as the world could call empty and yet still be full of joy. Think about Job for a minute. Job, at the worst moment of his life, after losing so much that he loved, And Job chapter 6, verse 10 says this, Then I would still have this one consolation, my joy in unrelenting pain, that I have not denied the word, the word of the Holy One. This word joy in the Hebrew in the Old Testament is really neat because it's only used one time in the Bible. It has a picture of sparks flying, at the other end of a horse's feet. If you've ever seen a horse kick or jump or, or, or that sort of thing, this is, and sometimes sparks would fly from their feet. This is the kind of joy that says when life kicks you, God is saying, here's how to kick back. I want to give you the kind of joy that when everything else is gone and lost, here is the spark of life. Here is how to continue in me. You'll be full 
even though the world thinks you're empty. Come on, hallelujah. Glory be to God. Just me? Come on, Pentecostal. And he says it comes from the words of the Holy One. In John 15, 11, that's what Jesus said. He said, these words I've spoken to you that my joy, not your joy, he says my joy might be in you. You can have the joy of Jesus, but you might have to dump out your joy first. You say, Pastor, how do I do that? You don't have to worry about it. Life will do it for you. Life's got that one. But as life does empty you, please know that just as Christ came into an empty world and filled it with life, the same Christ can be born inside of your heart and you can have not a joy that the world gives or a peace that the world gives, but you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. It could come from the inside out, not the outside in. Come on, I'm preaching to somebody. You could have life more abundantly. His joy. And it's from the inside out. And it comes from His Word. We get kind of, we get kind of wrapped up in the words that we use today. We say things like, enjoy that. You know, like if you've got a really good server, let's say over at Cheddar's, and you just ordered that, that made by scratch, you know, meal, and they say, enjoy, and you're like, I will, you know, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for telling me to enjoy it, I will. So, enjoy, but if you look at the etymology of that word, enjoy, it's really, actually, it's two words. It's two words. In the Old English, watch this, in the Old English, it was literally I-N, in, and then joy. It wasn't E-N, it was I-N. They believed that joy was something you stepped into, and it surrounded you. When you had real, true joy, you were now surrounded in it. You were not, it was not just inside of you, it was something that you were inside of it. And you can come into the spirit of Christ this Christmas. And I'm looking at many of you. I've spent time with you. I've been to your house. I know your story this year. This has been a hard year. This has been a year of heartbreaks for many of you. There, have, there are many people in this room, as I look at your faces, I know that this has been a very trying year. But yet somehow, some way, you found a way to stay within the spirit of the living God. And enjoy Jesus. And I say, God bless you. Hats off to you. Be encouraged this morning. Continue to live that way. Because there's a world that looks on that doesn't understand. They don't get it. But they want it. Keep it up. You'll see the fire that has started within you burn into the lives of others. Keep loving Jesus and stay in joy. The fullness of joy is yours. Don't live life empty live life on jesus can you say amen? amen so when we consecrate our lives to god we prepare ourselves even though at times we're empty even though at times we see things missing we know that god is still bringing something better and something more i want to think about that for just a second as we talk a little bit about a very important a very important Faith tradition. It is the tradition of the Advent wreath. How many of you know anything about this? I'm just checking because I want to make sure I get it right. They'll be the ones that will see me later. You know. So the rest of you kind of grew up in a Pentecostal church or, or you grew up maybe in a non-denominational church. And so you've never seen this before. But I want to share it with you because it, it bears a story that tells us the glory of the Lord and how He brings joy to our life you see it is made of a wreath of holly sometimes the wreath would have uh, little thorns in it how many of you know that to battle the strain and the stress that comes on your mind jesus wore a crown of thorns and bled from the same place that you battle with stress he bled for that oh hallelujah 
And so we see the wreath as unending. We see it as evergreen. But we also see it as containing some thorns. And we remember for the sake of others in our family that this represents the, the joy that we can have. We no longer have to be stressed or strained. We can lean on our Savior, Jesus Christ, who took it all. He took it all. There are four main candles. And I'm going to begin with the first one. And I'm going to try my very best to light these candles. Come on, baby, light my fire. All right, cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> you don't know anything about that. That's good. All right. The first candle, very important. This is a candle that represents hope. As we consecrate our lives to Christ and we give ourselves back fully to Him because He's fully given Himself to us, we understand the hope of the prophets. The prophet Isaiah said He would come, that He would be born of a virgin, that He'd be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace would be upon His back, and by His stripes we'd be made whole or healed and we're filled with hope on that first Sunday and the next one very very important as we think about Advent we now celebrate and light the candle that gives itself to the flame as we begin to understand we've moved now from a candle that represents hope the prophets to the candle that represents Bethlehem this is love. Bethlehem. Beth, meaning the house. Lehayim would be bread or meat. This is the place where Jesus Christ was born. And love was wrapped up and given as a present to every one of you. Unwrap that present into your life. Receive that love today. Even though out in that world it would strip you of love. Inside Jesus Christ, we have the love of the Father. What does John 3.16 say? Come on, let's say it together, church. Come on. For God so loved. Stop. So loved the world. The world is a place of hate. And yet, for God so loved with me the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. We move on to the next candle. This one would represent something very important as well. As we think about the first one, it gives us an idea of hope. The next one gives us the ideas we're consecrated to the Lord of love. And the next candle gives us an even greater perspective. How now God has come for our lives. And He's replaced the emptiness in such a way. Are you with me this morning? Please, please, are you with me? He's given us now faith. He's given us now belief. He's given us now praise. And God now has given us something that the angels said could be anyone that God has favor with. Do you remember what the angels said? The angels said, Peace on earth on whom God's favor rests. Now I'm filled with not only hope, not only love, I'm filled with peace. And Jesus promised this. He said if you'd give your life to me in return, you would have peace. Not that the world gives, but my peace. He said, listen, in this world you'll have trouble. Not peace. That's a promise. But he said, be of good Cheer, for I have overcome this world. He says, you can have a peace that passes all understanding. You know what that means? You can't receive it with your noggin, your brain. You have to receive it in your spirit man and in your heart. And then it flows out by faith. And your mind is renewed. And your life is renewed. And everything now begins to change. Hallelujah. And last but certainly not least from these minor candles, we come to the rose color or the pink one. Joy. You see, if you, don't, if you don't have the hope of Jesus Christ first, 
you don't have joy. It's impossible to have joy. It's what the whole world is searching for. They want joy. But they don't know the hope of Jesus Christ first. You do. Share it with them. And if you think about that hope, we also think about the other candles. We also think about peace and love. If they don't know the love of Jesus Christ, they can't show the love of God. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 tells us, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that does not love knows not God, for God is love. And once these things are worked in your heart, you are now filled with joy. And last but certainly not least, in some homes, the final candle is lit. And in Advent, we celebrate Jesus himself and his return to this earth. It's white because of his purity. He's the Savior. But he's not going to be the only one pure. The whole earth will be changed because of his return. Can you say amen? amen. Does something jump within you this morning that Jesus is coming back? Is your joy the fact that Jesus is returning? Yeah. Oh, be careful, because we all say yes. But think about it. What if he came back on this next Christmas day? Well, Father, couldn't you have sent your son on New Year's? I wanted to have Christmas dinner first. There's a few things. That, now think with me. Be real. There's a few things I wanted to get done first. There's a few people in my life that don't ne yet know you. And as we celebrate you with a big meal and great presents in an awesome time, I don't know if I'm fully consecrated yet. I don't know if I'm ready yet. Not everyone in my household yet knows the hope. Come on. Not everyone in our household yet knows your hope. Not everyone knows your love. Not everyone knows your peace. Not everyone yet knows your joy. But Father, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. I'm not going to let the world blow it out. I'm going to let it shine this Christmas in my home with my neighbors and my friends, my coworkers. Someone's going to get saved. And that's my birthday present to you, Lord. Full consecration and a life that is alive and on fire for you. As the choir comes, I would like to see if we could all together celebrate this Christmas. And listen, we're going to celebrate with a candle of joy. And mine just went out. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, you're going to have to be careful because it goes out quick. And listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start in each of the rows. And I'm going to ask that you light somebody else.